Uh, now for our first presenter of the day, I'd like to introduce you to Joanna Borromeo. Uh, she is a treasure of Calgary soul and jazz and R&B music scene. A vocalist, a pianist, a Juno-nominated recording artist, influenced by some of the deepest, most beautiful musicians in history. Dynamic, heartfelt, and undeniably groovy, not to mention a natural entertainer, Joanna delivers a captivating performance wherever she goes. A musician with outstanding versatility, colleagues in the community know and appreciate her for a unique improvisational style, her music, spirit, and candor. Uh, and I've been referring to you as she, her, so if you could please uh, share with the audience your preferred pronouns, if I'm mistaken. <laughs> Uh, so please let's welcome Joanna for uh, the session on internalized patriarchy in jazz, how it harms and what's been done so far about it. Thank you. Well, it's uh, really great, uh, great to be here to be presenting in front of all of you. And, and in fact, I have to uh, confess, this is my first time that I'm um, standing in front of a group of people that uh, are here to listen about, to listen to, I guess, what I would have to say about patriarchy and jazz. So uh, I have my notes, so I'm good. But um, I just wanted to first uh, just kind of share a little bit more about me before we get started, just so that um, this, you know, where I come from kind of can offer some more context and perspective. So um, I am a Canadian-born Filipino um, and a member of the LGBT community. My pronouns are she and her. Um, and uh, I went to school, jazz school, in uh, the early 2000s. And it almost seems kind of funny to even mention kind of the decade or maybe the time in which I went to school. But um, Given that it was 20 years ago, the, the uh, I suppose the political and social climate back in the day in the day has changed, um, you know, uh, and uh, so a lot of my experience that I will be maybe drawing from, and uh, a lot of my experience has been uh, used to inform uh, the, the things that I will share today. Um, so the title, internalized, it's a long title, internalized patriarchy, how it harms and what's been done so far about it. Actually, I have to confess, it was a working title uh, when I first submitted my proposal. Um, mm -hmm. And I had the intention of maybe uh, shortening it once I had also uh, kind of like more deeply conceptualize what I'd like to say. But of course, as time wore on, <laughs> I just let it let it be what it is. And, and at first I was a little bit worried that maybe the title might actually come across as um, having the potential to actually alienate and maybe even cause harm to women. Um, and so I kind of had to take a step back and, and, and really just check where my uh, intentions were coming from. And the more I explored, the more that I researched, uh, the more conversations that I had with women in the jazz community here and um, um, other individuals who I actually went to school with, uh, the more I realized that it is an important aspect to talk about um, when it comes to uh, examining patriarchy and its impacts. Um, you know, uh, the social climate has changed so much um, for the better. You know, I, I'm really happy that, um, you know, there are these very strong movements like Black Lives Matter, um, you know, movements that are standing up for climate justice, and of course, gender and sexual uh, justice. I think, um, I think just like you would uh, talk about systems of power and oppression and racism, you can do that with, uh, with uh, gender justice. And um, so when you talk about the oppressor, oppressor you, you, you end up having to also refer to those who are oppressed as well. Mm -hmm. and, and so I decided to keep the title and uh, I just really wanted to shed light on how jazz is um, gender biases and 
gendered attitudes have encouraged internalized patriarchy or specifically internalized sexism. Um, when you think of how, um, I suppose, delayed the, uh, the jazz community, the jazz as a music, jazz as a culture, uh, how delayed it is in um, addressing sexism in music, um, it isn't, it isn't far-fetched to think that um, women would experience uh, this kind of internalization. And when I say women, I do refer to the expansive uh, definition of women moving forward. So, um, yeah, I want to address inter internalized patriarchy as the first part of my presentation. Um, and I want to discuss it because removing it is just another step, not just, but it's another important step towards achieving gender justice. In the second half of my presentation, I, I realized in my research, I realized that ca the Canadian jazz music scene is different from the American jazz music scene and other scenes around the world like the UK, South Africa, Japan. There are different uh, cultural norms and uh, I, I, I suppose uh, situations that make uh, the struggle for gender justice require different mm -hmm. needs. Um, so I thought it was important to address um, Canada, which is where we are and where I live, where we all live, and, um, and, and the jazz scene and what it's like. So that'll be my second part of my presentation. Okay, so, I mean, we're all pretty familiar with patriarchy here, both, you know, um, uh, everybody. Um, but let's talk about the indicators of, of patriarchy and jazz. Um, when you look at the gatekeepers and the influencers um, in jazz, um, you realize it's, it's not that hard to understand why patriarch patriarchy exists. Um, when you think of who occupy the roles of jazz faculty members, club owners, booking agents, managers, band leaders, musicians, journalists, mm. jazz critics, scholars, musicologists, ethnomusicologists, you realize that most of these jobs are, are predominantly occupied by men. So when you realize the the traditional and established jazz discourse is, is actually written and discussed by, um, you know, a group of men. It's, it's really easy for issues um, and, 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 the, and the needs for gender equality to be just almost overlooked um, a little bit. So um, obviously a scene for men made by men for men, traditionally, can, uh, can lead to gender biases and gender attitudes. Um, and uh, if you think about the history of jazz, you know, when it started in New Orleans in the 20s, um, you know, there was a firm grip of, uh, <laughs> I guess, m mobs and, mob, mobs and, uh, and very masculine, uh, male dominated, uh, you know, organized crime groups, I would say, and they had a firm grip on the industry. So you can imagine the kind of violence that, uh, was, uh, perpetrated and, uh, uh, experienced by women of that time. Um, and if you continue to look through the history, you realize, uh, the historical invisibility of women, which um, lots of many, many women today are addressing. For example, Terry Lynn Carrington, who is the founder of the Berkeley Institute for Gender, Jazz and Gender Justice. Uh, she recently um, examined a very commonly overlooked, but huge, like uh, overlooked um, piece of jazz history, the, the, uh, the jazz real book, which has, um, you know, there have been many volumes created, but if you look through those pages, um, there's only a small number, if one, two, I can't remember exactly what the number is. There's just a small number of women composers in that book. So you, you could just even see just by looking at that alone, you realize that, um, 
the the practice of erasing women and their contributions to jazz is, has existed since the 20s and it's been a whole century of that and um patriarchy another indicator of patriarchy is uh the this idea of this gender divide where certain things of jazz are masculine certain things of jazz are feminine and um and so what this leads to is a gender divide. And what's difficult about that is that authentic jazz historically has been known to have masculine attributes. You know, the, the, the uh, masculinization of instruments. You know, you, if, you're, if you play the piano, if you sing, chances are you were a woman. And, uh, and if you played the drums, you were the exception to the rule. Um, and it was very hard for you to be uh, accepted and recognized in, in the scene. And, and that was kind of the nature of the 20s, the 30s, all the way up until now, you know? Like it's only been in the last couple of decades, I would say, that we've seen a prolifer proliferation of women instrumentalists who are not just you know, singing and playing the piano <laughs> or, or teaching theory classes, um, but playing um, traditionally masculinized instruments, uh, the drums, the saxophone, um, and uh, the trumpet, the upright bass and guitar, and all of those, those oddly masculinized instruments. But when we have this dichotomy of masculine and feminine, um, that is uh, that creates this this hierarchy of status, and e even even when people aren't trying to, like when musicians aren't trying to do that, that there it's still there, and um, that existence uh, or that frame of thinking um, just subordinates women um, and 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 uh, takes or considers female or f feminine attributes as, as not embodying authentic jazz. And that's how it's been. And, uh, you know, the, the feminization of instruments actually does lead towards attitudes of male supremacy, sexism, the notion, the notion that uh, masculinity is supposed to dominate uh, or tame or control women. We hear this in code language all the time, even today. <clears throat> you know, we're, our bodies are, are controlled, our gender roles are policed. Um, we're supposed to dress a certain way as jazz musicians. I, I look at websites of jazz festivals and I see promo shots of women. Sometimes they're either you know, and I and I don't. I'm not. Um, I'm not uh, dis uh, or invalidating this dress, but there is this traditional style of dress to embody the feminine side, mm -hmm. and not honor uh, a woman's identity if that's not how they um, identify themselves, or if that's not how they like want to present themselves. Um, in addition to uh, this whole, you know, gender divide of masculine versus feminine, there is this uh, this notion of homophobia, and um, and it, and uh, and it's is rooted in the times of the twenties through the forties through the sixties, um, where jazz institutions based their education on bebop, just like this. 20 or 30 decade window of jazz music that is tied to this culture of, um, you know, just straight, <laughs> straightness <laughs> and uh, not allowing any room for anything out of that um, out of that narrative and that, uh, and, and, and it's, a, it's not a, not necessarily to say that it's a violent homophobia, but it's, it stems from an insecurity that's introduced by the gender divide. Because as we know, um, there, there are different, uh, masculinity and versus femininity also creates this strange, I guess, hierarchy of, ultra masculine versus softer masculine and so on. And uh, 
that also contributes to this idea that, okay, you know, in order to play authentic jazz, which is supposed to be characterized by uh, masculinity and bravado and you take what you take what you want and that kind of idea and you just take up space and all of this and and, and be complex and fancy um, you know it's for for individuals who um, may not necessarily uh, embody or even agree with or want to um, express that that kind of machismo, I guess, uh, it's, it, it can create levels of insecurity that can actually um, also cause harm to men. And uh, so on and on it goes. So those are the indicators, some of the indicators of patriarchy and jazz. And, um, and how does all of that uh, get internalized amongst women? Um, well, um, it's not uncommon for my women counterparts to to almost uh, masculinize certain physical traits or cultural traits or social traits, how they communicate. Um, just the other day, I was, I was speaking with a friend of mine who's a singer, and uh, she she confessed to me sometimes she masculinizes her voice just so that she could be heard amongst a group of men um, because she has been taught, she's been in cult, in, uh, in, indoctrinated with this idea that the only uh, way you'll be heard or your voice will be validated or your opinion will be validated is if you deepen your voice, or you take up or you personify what authentic jazz, uh, jazz musician is supposed to be. And uh, the this loss or suppression of feminine traits and by the way feminine traits like empathetic leadership um compassion um just nurturing generosity uh creativity um community um these when these traits are suppressed they it leads to less support for each other so we lose this uh this much needed community uh, of support that we need to navigate these uh, rather hostile um, and unsafe environments that can potentially be created. Um, and uh, it also, it actually <coughs> encourages a negative sense of competition. And uh, it stems from this idea of the lone exceptional jazz woman. And so that's something that um, I can't take credit for. I've been doing research, and in fact, at, at the end of this talk, if anybody wants to uh, uh, receive or get links to these papers that I've been reading, I'd be more than happy to share that with you at the end. Um, but the idea of the lone exceptional jazz woman, when you realize um, jazz as a as a kind of business term, the commodifying tendencies of jazz tend to tend to kind of glorify this idea that there is only one um, this one lone exceptional jazz bassist or this one lone exceptional jazz drummer or this one lone exceptional jazz pianist who can really only be there for a certain period of time and then we move on to the next one. It's the same with singers, you know. Um, and other instrumentalists. And um, again, we women can sometimes feel out of, out of a need to survive this industry, to continue to thrive and grow and develop their careers. Um, we'll sometimes have to decide whether they're gonna play the game a little bit or not. Um, and and it's, it's because of this notion of needing to be accepted into this old boys club in order to be protected and shielded from um you know the more overt uh styles of sexism right you know to not be told like why don't you smile a little more or why don't you fix your hair a little bit or wear a sexier dress or um or not even be told 
you know, wow, you, you play like a, you play like a dude or you play like a girl, you know, like if you are accepted into the old boys club, you're, you're kind of protected from that. But at the same time, then you're leaving behind, um, you're leaving behind, um, the other women who will be, uh, forgotten about because of this notion that there's only room for one exceptional jazz woman. So this, uh, it's, it creates a sense of powerlessness at the end of the day. And, um, that leaves women uh, vulnerable to uh, more patriarchy, where um, uh, an industry member in the, jazz, in the jazz scene will say, hey, you look like you need help, and uh, let me help you. Let me help you record your album. I'll promote it for you. Um, you know, let me help you. And it comes across as benevolent sexism but it is still sexism because it uh, continues to support this notion that women are inferior and not as capable as men to play music that is dominated by men and uh and that suit that's it's it's burdensome it's damaging to uh the mental health of women um, to the point where some women will just leave the industry. I've seen so many of my uh, colleagues from school just leave, either no longer call themselves a jazz musician, you know, move into different industries such as, you know, composing for TV and film out of being absolutely fed up with uh, the status quo and seeing the same names and the same individuals continue to get the same grants to record the same albums to go on tour and so on and so forth or to just quit entirely and so we are constantly battling this this drain of talent um, that has historically contributed to jazz since it started. And what that creates is it perpetuates uh, the, um, the, 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 I guess the, it actually helps support this idea that men are gonna be the jazz faculty members. Men are gonna be the booking agents. Men are gonna be the band leaders. Um, they're gonna be the stage crew, they're going to, you know, they just, they're going to be the journalists. It's, it's because, you know, patriarchy just creates such a hostile environment for women, you know? Um, so yeah, it's just, it's, it's a cycle. It's, it's definitely a cycle. Um, in addition to, in, uh, another aspect of internalized patriarchy or sexism is this idea of, of all girl bands. And I say this with, um, a, with a lot of care and a lot of thought. Um, I've been a member of an all-girl band um, uh, called Bitch It's Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I recognize it can be for some, but maybe a, a sensitive or problematic name. Um, but the spirit in which that uh, this band got together was purely just out of a need to play music. Um, and, and it had no commercial goals. Um, there were no political motives. It was three friends who all played different instruments and could all hang and all appreciated the same music coming together to play, play music in a, in a club every now and again. And, um, and that's been a really positive experience. Um, but the interesting thing about the commodifying tendencies of selling music, specifically jazz music, to an audience that upholds traditional gender roles and continues to re remain a certain marker of a type of social class um, and social standing, economic status, what have you. Um, 
the commodifying tendencies, and this again, I have to say, is not my own idea. Um, and I can share my uh, my uh, the papers and and, and the uh, articles that I've uh, come across this idea first, but. Uh, these uh, commodifying tendencies of jazz as a business um, tends to uh, sometimes and um, lend itself to, you know, the masculization of women in the band, um, depending <laughs> depending on the project. Um, and I, and I've, I've I've witnessed um, what kind of harm can be done um, when when the focus of commodifying jazz music or women musicians to sell music, uh, what it can do. There's markers of, 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 of toxicity would include a lack of empathy, uh, the tendency to again hire more exceptional jazz women in the same circles, further marginalizing other women and leaving, um, I guess, you know, not giving opportunity to other women or limiting it. Um, this idea of almost gatekeeping in a sense, um, you know, being preoccupied with commercial success and clout um, that can really, uh, really bring in some um, patriarchal pa pa practices into a project or an organization. Um, and uh, yeah, it creates a, an unsafe environment for women in general. So um, usually the most marginalized in, in, in these types of groups will be uh, people of color, uh, members of the LGBTQ, especially if they're not band leaders of such all girl bands. Um, so, uh, that is kind of like an overview of like internalized patriarchy and how it can harm. And, um, so I want to kind of pivot to, uh, the Canadian jazz scene because, um, you know, there's a lot of really great work that's been happening here in our country, um, alongside, uh, the work that's been done in the United States, again, mentioning, uh, the Berkeley Institute for Jazz and Gender Justice, and then um, organizations like Women in Jazz, uh, the, the Women in Jazz organization, um, who uh, they, they are about creating social change through activism, creating opportunity for uh, women and non-binary people to work and perform in jazz and develop and be mentored by uh, other women. Um, now the question is, where is the Canadian jazz music scene now? So these are my personal thoughts and my own, own observations. It's in policy, it stands for gender equality. Um, it's really encouraging to see conferences like this, um, you know, featured spotlights uh, written by jazz journalists saying, oh, you got to follow the, the top 30 or 10, you know, emerging women in jazz, you know, th those things are great um, and very important um, as well. Um, but in practice, it still stands for gender inequity. For example, I saw Michael Buble when he came to Calgary and there was like a very clear visual divide between women and men on stage. Hmm. The men who uh, he tours with are, uh, sorry, I guess the band that he tours with, they're all men, they're all instrumentalists, they play brass, they play the rhythm section instruments and, and whatnot. And the, uh, on the other side of the stage is uh, women and um, playing stringed instruments, not a single man on that side, not a single woman on the other side. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's Michael Buble, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know? And it's just, when I saw that, I, I thought to myself, okay, we still have a lot of work to do. Um, but uh, I mean, that's just one tiny example. Um, this, uh, the nature, the need, sorry, for school faculties to uh, balance genders here 
Um, I, I kind of did a quick like a quick look at all of the uh, websites of the uh, various institutions in Calgary or Canada to see what the uh, ratio of women to men are. U of T, 33 faculty members, nine of them women, that counts for 25%. Two, uh, two women are, um, sorry, I don't know what I, what I wrote there. One is a bassist, three piano players, three vocalists, and I can't remember what, oh, two, two uh, faculty members are woodwind instructors. Uh, McGill University, who uh, is the first uh, university to start a jazz program, 33 faculty members, five women. And it's really interesting because of the history of jazz in Canada, Montreal was a cultural hub for black American musicians to play uh, during the interwar years. And then and the five women out of these 33 faculty members, that makes up 15%, two of them again, piano, one doubles on sax and voice, and then two more just on voice. You look at the website and I thought to myself, I, I thought, wow, that's a lot of performative diversity. And with this equity st statement for all, you know, they welcome all and they want to promote gender equity, but lists women at the bottom of their faculty list by instrument. Um, and, uh, and that's it. And this is this is Montreal, uh, Cap Capilano College. Um, twenty five faculty members, five women, so that's twenty percent. Three are voice. One is voice piano. One is arranging and composition. So you can kind of now start to get a clear picture, you know, how these schools are hiring. And uh, <laughs> and then three articles were posted on this faculty website. Two had the following headlines: "A man and his music, the all the world's his stage." So we have a lot of work to do. Humber College, fifteen faculty members, one woman who plays the guitar. So that accounts for seven percent. And Humber is. Uh, one of the most prestigious schools for jazz. People around the world would come to Humber to study jazz. St. Francis Xavier, 13 faculty members, two women, both of whom teach voice. Um, University of Manitoba, 12 faculty members, one woman teaches voice. Selkirk College, nine faculty women, sorry, nine faculty members, two of which are women. Again, they teach voice. Uh, Ambrose University in Calgary, three faculty members, uh, one woman who teaches piano. Um, and I have to say the new faculty at the University of Calgary, um, super disappointing <laughs> to say the least after all of this discussion of, of Me Too, uh, the Me Too movement and all of this public discourse about how we can achieve gender equality and gender equity in jazz. Seven faculty members, zero women. And yeah, that sucks. <laughs> that really sucks. I don't know what the hiring uh, criteria are, but it really seems like not a lot of work was done to reach out to well-deserving women with master's degrees or PhDs to fulfill any of these roles. I don't know if it's, if it's because of budgetary reasons or, or what, but super disappointing. So the message right here is uh, whoever's in charge of hiring, just hire outside of your circles. Yeah. And, uh, and academically, the reason why we need women on faculty is not just for representation, uh, not just, but we need to academically include gender and sexuality theories and jazz studies. If there's music business, if there are classes on music business and uh, classes on jazz history, it should include at least gender, if not gender and sexuality theories in jazz studies from a feminist perspective, because we need to create new theory around uh, jazz history and the study of jazz. So that is my assessment of the Canadian jazz scene. And uh, 
if we don't change um, these things, the, the institutions of jazz and the faculty members and who they are, um, it's going to be very difficult to challenge the established jazz discourse, which we absolutely need, because jazz discourse is what helps shape and define the future of jazz. We need to change the established, established jazz discourse in scholarship, in politics, the oral history, and you know the entertainment industry itself. Um, so this lack of political and cultural historical education in Canadian jazz scenes will just result in in um, the the face of jazz to be predominantly uh, represented by hetero uh, <coughs> <coughs> sexual men <laughs> um, who may be very uh, have uh, be very well intentioned, but. You know, if you don't know what's up, it's it's your lack of action and the impact of that that really harms women. So, thanks for listening, and um, yeah, let's uh, let's celebrate. Let's continue to celebrate gender justice today in jazz. Thank you. Thank you.